Hello and welcome to The Travel Show. It's a chilled one for me this week as we're coming from my gaff right here in London. It's a lockdown special with a look at how some of the world's biggest events and festivals are moving the fun online. We've got news about offers of free holiday accommodation for key workers. We go on lockdown with the Beefeaters at the Tower of London. And with so many flights and holidays cancelled, we've got an update on how companies are doing on giving our money back. Spoiler alert, not very well. It's a frustrating time for those of us who are itching to get back on the road again. But we're actually quite lucky that we can stay at home right now because there are millions of key workers around the world. Doctors, nurses, the people we buy our food from, the people who empty our bins, who don't have that luxury. But in recent weeks, there's been an outpouring of support for them, not just in weekly claps like these, but with the tantalising offer of free holidays once bans are lifted. Here in the UK, a campaign under the hashtag TreatOurNHS now has hundreds of giveaways on social media. We have a holiday let in Devon and I put it out there on Instagram for a giveaway two nights to an NHS member of staff. And very quickly, I had lots of nominations coming in um, and I just thought, only one person's gonna win this. So she decided to spearhead the campaign and made this video to help spread the word on social media. Some people with large accounts shared it and very quickly that message got across and the rest has followed basically. We have over 700 people on giveaways on board now, which is amazing. We've got such a breadth of uh, accommodation on offer. We've got, uh, it ranges from a shepherd's hut in Dorset to an um, amazing chateau in the south of France. You know, there's just amazing acts of generosity all across the board. Sarah decided to open the offer up again for her own property and got sent 2,000 nominations. The winner picked at random. So I, I thought it was, is it a, a night stay, a two night stay? So it's two night stay um, when you get down here and then um, at the rest in the wall for a lovely cafe down the road is giving you a meal and you've got breakfast. You can just go oh and spend, spend away to your heart. Oh. Yeah, oh, love. Who bought, who nominated you? Um, one of the girls who I worked with the other day, um, she nominated me. Oh. That was really sweet. Oh. I can't believe it. Oh, bless. Oh, you're making me cry. <laughs> it's so nice to, like, win something. Let's hope that once the lockdown eases here in the UK, it won't be too long before Nurse Rachel gets that much-deserved break. But this idea is not just limited to health workers here in the UK. The international campaign under the hashtag MyTravelPledge has been gaining serious traction abroad, with properties and hotel rooms on offer to health workers and also low-income key workers such as hospital cleaners. Avery and Tiffany nominated each other. They're both nurses at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, Canada. We just made a plan to nominate each other, but her nomination for me got selected. And yeah, it just so, like within a couple of days, she texted me and was like, oh my gosh, um, your nomination was selected. Of course, my first thing was, I'm gonna take you. And she's like, no, no, it's for you and your husband. It's because Avery was supposed to go to Spain this year for her 10 year anniversary. And of course that's got canceled. That got canceled. So hopefully this can, can be her 10 year anniversary vacation. Avery has got a free stay here in the Dominican Republic when travel restrictions finally ease for a well-earned rest. Working in the healthcare sector right now is really scary. We are both psychiatric nurses, so we serve really the most marginalized and vulnerable population. With COVID, we're really afraid that it's gonna spread within that population. So every time we go to work, it's 
you know, we kind of feel uncertain, we're scared, um, we're scared to bring it back to our families. So it's difficult, it's uncertain, it's definitely a really challenging time right now to be, um, to be working in healthcare. Ian and Andrew set up the campaign to recognise and reward key workers. But for them, an important side effect is to help out the tourism industry in Spain, where they run a B&B. &B. The pair have had quite a response. They received more than 3,000 nominations in April alone. People assume it's a competition or it's a prize draw, and we're trying to make it clear that it's actually not a prize draw. Either uh, they can nominate themselves, a colleague, a friend or whatever, or be nominated by, by somebody, by a friend of theirs. And it comes through to us here, so the, the sort of central database. Um, and we will then uh, try to help allocate them something sensible and something suitable for their, their, their requirements. Some people have already specified they'd quite like something in the UK because they can't afford a flight. Some people are looking forward to a break in the sun. So we try to match it as best we can. I just need to finalise this and put this in. The pair have received more than 3,000 nominations in the past month from around the world with a fast growing portfolio of international properties on offer. The key word for me is hope. Hope and support. They are just working full on. If they're not working, they're sleeping. So this is just something that they can actually just nominate they can act on and they know that someone out there is actually looking out for them and there is a light at the end of the tunnel and um, a free stay would you know make their lives so much uh, more bearable at the moment and to be honest the, the situation we're in is that it's the very least that we can do What a brilliant campaign and a richly deserved reward for those people around the world who are doing so much for us at the moment. Right. For the last few weeks, we've been getting loads of messages from people who are still trying to get their money back from cancelled holidays without much success. Now, it's probably the biggest issue in travel at the moment. Um, our global guru, Simon Calder, is across town and hopefully he can bring some clarity to uh, a much, a very confusing situation. Simon, how are you, first of all? Well, look, thank you. I'm well and happy, but I've never been busier uh, with just thousands of travel show viewers getting in touch saying, help, what are my rights? What can I do? So, Simon, tell us what are people's rights um, when it comes to getting money back with cancelled um, holidays? Under European passenger rights rules and also the rules which pertain in the United States, airlines, if they do not operate your flight, have to give you a full refund. However, there have been cases right across Europe and the US and the world of airlines saying we can't refund you, we'll give you a credit note. In other words, you're allowed to travel on that airline sometime in the next six months, year, two years, um, but your money is tied up with them. Now, if you are covered by consumer rules that entitle you to a refund, and that's the European Union, the UK, the United States and some other places, then just keep fighting for a refund. You should get the money back eventually. Elsewhere, well, it might be a matter between you and your credit card company. Well, it, is, it feels like a really frustrating situation, but I guess it, the idea is just not to give up and keep trying to get that money back. Just keep going. You should get your money back. But I'm one of many, many people who've got a, a ticket, um, in fact, in my case, from Saudi Arabia to Egypt for a flight which never took off. And I'm having really tough times trying to get my money back for that. If Simon Calder's struggling to get his money back, what are we going to do? Well, um, keep, keep trying. So it sounds like we're not going to be getting back to normality anytime soon then, Simon. You've still got hundreds of flight bans in place. And so it's a matter, unfortunately, as there has been pretty much throughout this crisis of wait 
and see. Mm. What I foresee happening is that we will be asked, for example, to have some kind of vaccination certificate. Now, this is my old vaccination certificate. It hasn't seen much action recently, um, but it will possibly include something to show when there is a working vaccine against COVID-19 that you have had that vaccination um, and more to the point that you perhaps have had the infection and that you are now immune. But of course, that is all again it's the whole backdrop of what the health authorities regard as giving you immunity. All right, cheers, Simon. Hopefully I'll get to see you soon in person once this is all over. Take care, mate. Okay, it's time for us to jump across the world to Japan to meet another member of the Travel Show family. It's Carmen. Hey, Carmen. Hi, Eddie. How are you? I'm not bad considering the circumstances. Uh, tell me about what's happening over there. Is it just Japan or the whole of Japan in lockdown or is it just Tokyo? Well, it's the whole of Japan is in a state of emergency now, but it's really more of a soft lockdown as they're calling it because the government doesn't have any real powers to fine you if you leave your home or have a big social gathering. They can just request that you do so. So it's, it's really mixed. For instance, the public transport is still operating but my local supermarket insists you wear a mask if you go inside. Small businesses are still open, albeit with limited hours. There's um, some izakayas, which are small Japanese eateries. They're still open, but they have to shut at 8 p.m. So it's really, really mixed here. It's such a strange new world that we're living in, isn't it? Um, and another thing for Japan is the Paralympics and Olympics being postponed. That must have been a real huge blow for you guys out there. Yeah, definitely, Addy. It was a huge blow. And as you'd know, in any city in the lead up to the Olympics, there's a real buzz about the place. And 2020 was meant to be Tokyo's big year. So many are saying that's why it was so late to declare a state of emergency, because they were really hanging on and hoping that the Olympics and Paralympics would still go ahead. But once it was finally cancelled or postponed, actually, for next year, that's when they invoked the state of emergency. But the IOC are confident that it's going to happen next year and the Olympic flame is burning in Fukushima as we speak as a symbol of hope and recovery. As well as the Olympics, live events across the board have all been cancelled or postponed as the race to contain the virus continues. And whether it's sports, music or arts, a lot of these gatherings rely on a shared physical experience that's now no longer allowed in over a third of the world's countries. For the first time in 70 years, the Edinburgh Festival has been cancelled. The plug has been pulled on Glastonbury's 50th anniversary, and Dubai has rescheduled the World Expo, resulting in a loss of tourism income from over 20 million people who were due to attend what was likely to be the UAE's biggest event in its history. Well, this hasn't stopped organizers looking for new ways to connect audiences, with many exploring exciting projects to move the fun online. And uh, here's my simulator setup. So you can see we've got the fan attack wheel, Formula One has launched a virtual Grand Prix series, a live stream during which professional drivers compete against each other in a specially adapted video game. But the race is strictly for entertainment's sake, with no official points to be won. The Champagne Antics might have to wait until next year. Another institution trying to capture the spirit of their event online is Burning Man, a festival usually held deep in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. So for us, uh, really, it almost really wasn't a question. Uh, why cancel Burning Man and leave this sort of opening, this vacancy, this sadness? But why not take it and turn it towards the opportunity that we have right now um, and lean in towards what Burning Man does best and bring people together? Original tickets will still be valid for the online event, with newcomers welcome too. The experience will be spread across different platforms, which is fitting, considering the theme for this year's festival was the multiverse. We're really going to be looking and imagining that members of the community will help participate so that the, the best parts of what you get at Burning Man, the inspiration uh, to be with other people, the trust, the playfulness, the creativity, uh, that we can create an environment that's like that. And I think there's an irony right now where we're all more isolated uh, 
I'm seeing more interesting content coming out of the internet than we've ever seen before. Another highlight of the cultural calendar that's planning to move online is Pride. San Francisco cancelled its 50th anniversary celebration. The parade is usually one of the largest in the world, and this year over one million people were expected to attend. Instead, they'll be joining hundreds of other cities in the virtual celebration. On June 27th, Global Pride will take the form of a 24-hour live stream event featuring performances, speeches, and messages from activists all over the world. So Interpride has done a fantastic job at engaging and connecting over 250 Pride organisations globally to feel a sense of togetherness, to bring hope to all LGBTIQ communities in the face of adversity. You might remember Tony from the adventures we joined him on when he visited Jerusalem and more recently Ethiopia. Now Tony calls himself the blind backpacker, but not only does he have almost no vision, he's also partially deaf too, and it's his ambition to travel to every country in the world. He's on the road pretty much all of the time, but not anymore. Hi Tony, so where are you calling us from this time? Hi there, yeah, I'm, um, I'm actually in my uh, own apartment at the moment in a small town called uh, Timworth in Devon. Exotic Devon! Yeah, very exotic. So I hear you were travelling around Africa when the virus hit. Yeah, that's right. I, um, I was in uh, Southern Africa. Um, beginning of March, I flew to Johannesburg and then, uh, and then uh, crossed into Zimbabwe and Zambia. I visited both those countries before. I wanted to sort of um, get some videos and fo uh, photos of uh, Victoria Falls, really. The sound is absolutely unbelievable. This time of year, uh, March, April, it's um, rainy season, so it's full of water. So uh, when you're walking through it, you just get absolute drenching. When did you find out that you had to stop your trip and come home, Tony? Well, it's starting to get more and more difficult, um, sort of end of March. Um, I was planning to go to, uh, to uh, Namibia and I actually went down to the border and they basically wouldn't let me in and said, no, no, okay, that's that then. And then um, I got underlying health conditions, um, had a kidney transplant back in 2008, so I needed medication. And it was getting more and more difficult to try and arrange to get that sent to Zambia. So I thought uh, my best option might be come back to the, the UK, as sad as that was. I eventually managed to find a flight for an extortionate price and then and then I've been in lockdown more or less ever since. My goal is to visit every world every country in the world and that's that's what wakes me up that's what gets me up in the morning, gets me out of the house normally. Where am I going next? So yeah, I'm planning the next trip. Um sort of looking at the end of the year to go actual travelling again, sort of October, November, December. Depends on, you know, the situation here and the situation in those other countries. Tony, thank you so much. Stay well. Uh, looking forward to hearing about some more of your adventures in the future. Take care, be safe yourself. Now, just a few miles away from here, there's one place that's never had a problem with putting people in isolation. It's the Tower of London. Welcome to the Tower of London, where kings and queens have walked for over 500 years. Today is our first day in proper lockdown. Don't worry though, we've got security here, the army here guarding the jewels. We are under no threat at all. But we are locking down just for safety of the virus. It's very unusual, there's nobody here, um, just the people who live here. There's 37 of us that, that guard the tower. Uh, we're all former sergeant majors, we've all spent over 22 years in the military. If we get the job, this is where, where we've got to live for our, with our families. The Tower of London is uh, one of the most iconic sites in the world. Uh, we're very proud to keep it and maintain it and look after it. The crown jewels are here, uh, and obviously we have our ravens as well. The raven's been here since time began at the Tower of London. The old legend said if the ravens ever leave the tower, the White Tower will crumble and the monarchy will be full of a great disaster. Yes, and there's the White Tower. Kings and queens of England have lived in that tower for over 500 years. This is where the dungeons and the torture chambers was once located. 
I have been asked by my social media advisor, my 23 year old son, that I've got to ask you to like and subscribe to this channel. I've absolutely no idea what that means, but if that means anything to you, do that. I would say that in the history, uh, in the thousand year history of the Tower of London, this is completely unprecedented because there is no one here. Normally this site will be uh, packed, uh, average 10 to 12,000 people a day. When you think about what's happened in, in the past, yes, we've had world wars and we've had bombs dropping on the tower. Things were still going on. It's a big crisis uh, across the world, but here in the tower we're trying to make things as, as, as normal as possible. You know, we've, we've got to get on as a, as a community, as a community, there's, you know, there's 45 families and the children and all the rest of it. We all know each other very, very well and, uh, and all find it an honour to live within the walls of the tower. In the tower, we actually have a few key workers, we've got NHS workers, we've got nurses, we've got lifeboat crewmen, we've got border force, we've got special constables. So tonight, in a minute now, my cut back, hopefully we should have lit the tower blue and we should be showing our appreciation. Go! Thank you to the NHS. Personally, I've, I've, I've been, I've, I know quite a bit about the coronavirus because my, my, my wife um, actually was, uh, was tested positive and uh, spent two, two weeks in hospital. Uh, she fought for her life, uh, but uh, it's a success story because she's now out. And, uh, and she's really, really doing well. I personally do miss the buzz of having the visitors here and, you know, and, and engaging with them and, and having a good time, really. We didn't like the words of, we're now raising the drawbridge as former sergeant majors because we tend not to want to give in, but we did. We can't wait for the drawbridge to be lowered and start inviting our visitors from all over the world to come and see this absolutely fantastic, iconic site. Well, that's it from us for this week. Wherever you are though, stay safe, keep dreaming those dreams of travel, and we'll be back with you with a brand new episode in a few weeks time. Bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh,